stones, and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be deadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The word of the Lord. So we hear today about the temple being destroyed. Jesus tells us about that. This temple was an important building for the Jewish people, not only because of the religious significance as the house of God, but also because it served as a source of national pride and identity for the Jewish people, much like the Statue of Liberty or any of our national monuments does for us as Americans. King Herod virtually doubled Solomon's original temple mount, making it equal the size of 30 football fields. The size of the hewn stones for this construction ranged from two to 10 tons. And the Jewish historian Josephus reported that the entire facade of the temple was gilded with gold plates. When the sun rose in the east, the sight of the temple was blinding. The brilliance of the temple could be seen at quite a distance from all directions outside the city. So its destruction would seem to be the end of the world in the minds of the Jewish people, especially considering that it was the house of God. It was unfathomable. Even despite this gloom and doom that Jesus speaks about, hope is the theme for our texts today. Jesus warns us that there will be tough times ahead, and in those times, we need to live in hope because God's good plan will be realized. No matter what happens in life, God holds us close, and God will win in the end. That is the message that Jesus is giving us. It's not a timeline or a timetable for the end of the world. Instead, he is inviting us to live our lives in faith and hope each and every day. And as we do so, we have a greater appreciation for the present time that God has given to us. We don't have to worry about the future because each day is a gift. Now, that idea makes me think of a movie clip that I showed to some of the confirmation kids this past week. The movie was Kung Fu Panda, which is a cartoon for those of you who haven't seen it, with a big panda named Po, who in essence becomes chosen to save the world as the dragon warrior. Even though he has no real knowledge of Kung Fu, and of course he's a panda, so he's a little bit chubby and not at all fit or athletic in any way. So he goes through all sorts of training, and then at one point, he is discouraged about what faces him in the future. And the old kung fu master that he's speaking to tells him, you are too concerned with what was and what will be. There's a saying, yesterday is history, 
Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. And that is why it is called the present. Jesus tells us not to waste the gift of each day about worrying on the future. Now, I know this is not easy to do. We are ingrained to be constantly looking ahead, trying to figure out if we have enough money saved up for retirement, to pay the bills, to get through the winter, whatever it is. I understand that it's hard, but it's nonetheless what we're called to do. Now, some of you know that I have two older brothers, and I grew up watching them all the time, constantly watching everything that they did, because I was jealous. They were five and ten years older than me, so they got to do a lot of things that I didn't get to do at that point. They were doing all sorts of cool and fun things that I wanted to do, and I couldn't wait to be old enough to get to do all the things that they were doing. Things like going to the lake with friends to water ski or to go fishing, to learn how to drive, going out on dates, and even, if you can imagine it, I was jealous of the fact that they had jobs and got to work. I mean, how stupid was I? In some ways, it makes me think of the passage from Matthew 6, 34, where Jesus says, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. But today's trouble is enough for today. Now, I wasn't worrying all those years, but I was wasting time dreaming about what was going to happen in the future instead of enjoying the moment that I was in. Now, Jesus also speaks about earthquakes and pestilence, wars and natural disasters that will abound in life. They're just bound to happen. And he says that life will not be easy. And it will not be easy to follow him because of persecution. Now, as we know, Jesus never promised life would be easy or problem-free, but he reminds us to stand strong, to keep hope in our faith in him, and to be focused on the here and now. This week, I started reading Messy Spirituality by Mike Iaconelli, which I know is something that many of you read this past Lent for the book studies. Something caught my eye as I was reading through some of the chapters that seems to connect with our text for today. Iaconelli wrote this, Spirituality is a relationship. It is not about competency. It is about intimacy. Spirituality is not about perfection. It is about connection. The way of the spiritual life begins where we are now in the mess of our lives. Accepting the reality of our broken, flawed lives is the beginning of spirituality because we let go of seeking perfection and instead we seek God, the one who is present in the tangledness of our lives. Spirituality is not about being fixed. It's about God being present in the mess of our unfixedness. Jesus is saying to us that life is messy, but he is calling us to stay focused on our relationships with one another and with him. And when we do that, all will be fine eventually. It may not seem like it, and it will be tough, but we still have that hope. Jesus comes in the midst of the messiness of our lives. And that is the news that we and the rest of the world desperately need to hear. Jesus says, do not be terrified when you hear of these things. Do not fear what is to come. He says, in the middle of the fear and the doubt and the uncertainty, the death and the mess, I love you to the end of the age. Do not be worried. Do not be anxious over the rumors and the fears when you hear of bad things, do not be scared. The future is mine. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to remind us of, that even in the midst of our fear and uncertainty, even or especially in the midst of suffering and death, war or pestilence, persecution, the evil that we see on the evening news, in the midst of the conflicts in our lives, in the midst of economic fear, 
worry about our families, our friends, our children. In the midst of all of this, we do not need to fear the future because we know that all of history, all of time is headed toward God. We don't know what the future brings, that unknown evil that may be lurking out there, but we don't have to worry about it because we know who is in charge, and that is God. I don't know what, the, what tomorrow will bring, much less years from now, but I know that God holds us close in each and every day. And so we can live confidently and boldly in bad situations and in all times because everything is in God's hands. Now, it doesn't necessarily make it easier, as I've said, or less painful, but it gives us hope. It gives us something to live for. Many people have said, just take life one day at a time, and if need be, take it hour by hour, knowing, standing strong in the knowledge that God is holding you. God helps us hold on in difficult times. We can get through the fear and the uncertainty in life by reaching out to one another, reaching out to our hurting and lost world, reaching out to people who need to hear what we know, that God is in control and Jesus is Lord of our world. Another way to tackle this fear and uncertainty comes to us from, of all unlikely places, Facebook. There is a practice going on right now called 30 Days of Gratitude. And if you're unfamiliar with it, what it is is people post on, on Facebook or their other social media sites each day something for which they are thankful, something that brings them great joy or whatever it is, they give gratitude for it. These are often spontaneous. They're sometimes words of wisdom about friends or some other experience they've had, a blessing in their life. It's not necessarily anything that's prepared in advance. It's just whatever strikes them in that day. The thing that helps in this practice is that it gets people to look at the blessings in their lives. It helps give each of us an opportunity to avoid those moments of distress and conflict. It helps us keep focused on Jesus in spite of our ever-changing world. Jesus calls us to live without fear or worry, knowing that, knowing that not a hair on our head will perish. By stating things for which we are grateful, we recognize that our lives are grounded in God's grace. In focusing on our blessings, we don't focus on the worries and concerns as much as otherwise. Now, you may have heard the story about Martin Luther when he was asked what he would do if he knew the world was ending tomorrow. And his response was that he would plant a tree. He was not going to give up on the work that he was called to. He was going to continue investing his time and his energy in a future filled with hope. So how do we live for today when tomorrow is so unknown? We draw strength from God who invites our participation and endures long after the cities and the buildings and the stones have crumbled away. We adopt an attitude that asks not what God can do for us, but calls us to bring the kingdom of God just a little bit closer to others through our friendship, our relationship, even something as simple as a smile to a stranger. We love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray without ceasing, and we trust in a mighty God from whom all blessings flow. That is how we get through today we're not worrying about tomorrow. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for all the many blessings that you do, in fact, pour upon us. We ask that you help open our eyes to see all of those blessings each day. Help us to list them and state them and tell the people in our lives that we are thankful for them, to remember just how blessed we truly are.
We ask all this in your Son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us join in singing our song of the day. Thank you. 